the War and Peace Report, as we turn now south to the Olympics. The 2016 Summer Olympics open tonight in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, the first South American city ever to host the Games. More than 10,000 athletes across the world have convened in Rio's Olympic City for one of the most widely watched sporting events of the year. This comes as Brazil is battling an economic recession, a massive Zika outbreak, and the recent ouster of its democratically elected president, Dilma Rousseff. Human rights organizations have also expressed concern about the impact of the games on Rio's most vulnerable communities. Residents of Rio's favelas have spoken of battles against forced evictions, police violence and wasted spending. About 85,000 police, soldiers and other security officials will patrol the city during the Games. Chair of the International Olympic Committee, Thomas Bach, said despite the difficulties, the city is prepared to host the event. There were uh, huge, huge uh, challenges, if not uh, a deep crisis. And nevertheless, uh, you see that uh, uh, this country uh, that this city, uh, this organizing committee has uh, managed uh, to transform a city and to put uh, Olympic uh, Games uh, uh, on the stage. To talk more about the Rio Olympics, we're joined now by Dave Zirin in Washington, D.C., a sports editor for The Nation magazine. His recent article is called The Last Dance on Heading to Olympic Rio. He's the author of Brazil's Dance with the Devil, The World Cup, The Olympics, and The Fight for Democracy, also host of Edge of Sports. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Dave. So tell us about the significance of these Olympics and where they're happening in Brazil. Well, I mean, the significance is that they're happening in a city that was not the same city that won the Olympics uh, eight years ago. Uh, the Rio that won the Olympic bid in 2008 was a Rio that was experiencing stratospheric economic growth rates. It was um, a city that was fighting inequality. It was a city that actually argued, their leadership argued, and people believed that hosting the Olympics would be a tool for fighting inequality that would help in the, aid the social democratic vision uh, that was being put forth by the president of the time, uh, Lula, and his successor, Dilma Rousseff. So the Olympics were seen as something that was integrated into a broader project of a more democratic and more just Brazil. Uh, fast forward eight years later, and it's a dystopia relative to that original vision. Uh, unemployment is skyrocketing. Uh, the, uh, it's, I mean, almost double what it was even a couple of years ago in Rio, when, when, when the situation was even stagnating then, and a lot of unrest. At this point, we're talking about about 61 percent of people um, in the whole entire nation of Brazil say they wish the Olympics had never darkened their door. All they've brought is debt, displacement, and hyper-militarization. And I got to tell you, Amy, in, in looking at this closely, one of my deep concerns about the media coverage from, uh, from Western Europe and the United States is that it looks at all of these issues that Rio is facing, and it looks at, at them from the perspective of, this is about Brazil's governmental dysfunction. This is about Rio's inability to host these games. And what they don't look at is that what we're seeing is a feature of what happens when the Olympics come to town. Because you know this, Amy, because I've been coming on your show to talk about the Olympics since, I think, Beijing in 2008. And we have this same discussion. The only thing that changes is the scenery. Well, <clears throat> talk about the police. Uh, yes. Amnesty International says police killings are up over 103 percent in the last year. In 2015, one in every five homicides in Rio was uh, killing by police. I mean, this is absolutely stunning. I mean, say that statistic again so the audience hears it. Rio, which is one of the most dangerous cities in the Western world, one out of five homicides are committed by police. Uh, relative to a year ago, police killings are up 135 percent. And when I was in Rio in May, um, I interviewed uh, politicians across the board and people who live in favelas, pro-Olympic people, anti-Olympic people. And I asked them this very basic question, Amy. I said, um, is this increase in police violence? Is this because the Olympics are coming to town? Is this a pre-Olympic crackdown like we've seen in so many other cities? 
And interestingly, there was broad-based agreement across the board that this actually was not because of the Olympics, that all of these recent killings has much more to do with the economic crisis, which has meant the starving of a community policing program that had actually helped decrease violence uh, in the favelas. And what it's been replaced with instead is what is referred to as bope policing, or think about it as SWAT team policing, because it's much more cost-effective. And the more cost-effective way of policing poor neighborhoods in Brazil, and this might sound familiar to some neighborhoods in the United States, is you just go in with a militarized police force, shoot, and ask questions later. And so even — and this is the thing, though, that, that you can't separate that from the Olympics. Because whether we're talking about shoddy policing that's done on the cheap with a high body count, whether you're talking about the 30 percent cuts that have taken place uh, in health in the state of Rio while they're trying to control the Zika outbreak, or whether you're talking about cuts in education that are so extreme you've had hundreds of high schools occupied by students and teachers, all of these crises are taking place side by side with a 12 to $20 billion Olympic project that's just swallowing money. Can you talk about Dilma Rousseff now? I mean, as they say, they're going to put her on trial. That could lead to impeachment. They've already removed her as president. Yeah. I mean, and this is going this is beginning to take place just this week. And it's interesting that it happens uh, the same week that um, her predecessor, the person who got the Olympics, Lula da Silva, once the most popular politician literally in the world. Uh, has been brought up on obstruction charges, obstructing the investigation into uh, the bribery scandals that have affected every, every facet of Brazilian politics. Um, I think what's so interesting right now is that their plans—and when I say their plans, I'm talking about the people who organized the coup against Dilma—aren't quite working out as they thought. Like, their plan, I believe, um, and I think this is what a lot of observers inside of Brazil believe, is that they impeached her very specifically at a time so they could wait the six months, because that's what it says in Brazil's constitution. It's a six-month wait between impeachment and conviction, so it could take place within the shadow of these Olympics as a kind of kabuki theater to say to the world, Brazil is now under new management. The economy is up and running again. We're now a safe place to invest. You don't have to worry about, you know, any of our profits it's being used to fight inequality or all the things that were objectionable about the Workers' Party. And yet a funny thing's happened on the way to that neoliberal paradise. And that funny thing is that the economy has not stabilized. The new president, Michelle Temer, is more unpopular than ever. And so we're in a situation now where I think there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen when, when Dilma finally goes up for that final vote uh, to actually be removed from office, because there's, there's a vacuum at work right now. There's no uh, credible political voice that's in a position to take her place. And that's why one of the most widely spread photos that's going viral right now is a, a torchbearer named uh, Taricio Gomez. And people can look this up and find it online. It's on my Twitter feed. He was one of the torchbearers for the Olympics. And right in the middle, what he did was uh, he dropped trow. He dropped his shorts. He was wearing a leopard thong. And on each side of his thong, he had the words, impeach temer. So you had a little bit of protest going on that we might call cheeky. <laughs> I wanted to um, turn to the American tennis star Serena Williams, who just arrived in Rio, and was asked about the Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump. I am. Um, I don't. I don't involve myself in politics. I think it's really important for me to really pass the message of love and unity of, across all nations. Doesn't matter what race. Obviously, with me being African American, I'm very sensitive of, over a lot of things. But I think it's important that um, you know we should pass the message of love as opposed to hate. Dave Zirin, talk about the significance of Serena Williams speaking out. I mean, I think for for her to say I, I don't talk about politics, but I believe in love over hate. I mean. That just says something about these elections, that to say I'm for love over hate is actually a political message. Like what in previous election cycles might sound like a Hallmark card, tragically is in 2016 a cry of resistance. 
because Donald Trump actually does represent that kind of organized hate. And Serena Williams also, she makes that statement with a kind of, with a, with a background, if you will, uh, with a legacy that she's built over the last couple of years of being someone who has strongly spoken out against the extrajudicial killings of young black men and women, and someone who has linked her career to raising funds for the Equal Justice Initiative, which is a, a tremendous organization uh, that, that does work in terms of fighting the new Jim Crow and mass incarceration. So everything that Serena Williams says, I think, is just fraught with meaning. And it really, seriously, it doesn't take an advanced uh, uh, American studies degree from a university to read between the lines in terms of what she's saying there. But if people want more explicit political talk at these Olympics, please keep a close eye at Ibtihaj Muhammad. She is a U.S. fencer, and she is the first U.S. athlete to ever compete wearing a hijab. And she has already been explicit in her condemnation of Donald Trump and so proud of the fact that she is a Muslim representing the United States. We're going to break and come back to this discussion. We're talking to Dave Zirin, sports editor for The Nation magazine. He's headed to Rio, and we're going to be talking to him there, but getting a preview as the Rio Olympics are about to begin, his latest book, The Last Dance on Heading to Olympic Rio. Um, he's uh, his latest piece, his book, Brazil's Dance with the Devil, the World Cup, the Olympics, and the Fight for Democracy. Stay with us.